So I should say Yama. But I, I kind of practice good day. <laughs> anyway, Yama. It's great to be here. Thanks so much for inviting me, for having an international guest speaker this afternoon in this um, beautiful room, beautiful art gallery. Andrew, uh, thanks for making all this happen. I know what an incredible effort it is. And thank all of you for joining us. Um, it's been 10 years ago, I think, since I last was in Australia. Somewhere in my dark past, I was involved in the company TNT when it was acquired uh, by the Dutch Post. I am Dutch by origin. So I've been here a lot. Um, and I just got interviewed by ABC television. And it was remarkable, the questions that I got, you know, what do you think about the fact that the government in Australia doesn't have a climate policy and how can business act if that's not around? And wow, that sounded mighty complex. It also sounded mighty 10 years ago. Because in every other country in the world, that conversation has long died down. Their governments, citizens, businesses are pulling together to fight climate change to take climate action, to look at the opportunities that that brings. Of course, I would argue complex political environments are not unique to Australia. We have a few other countries which had rather surprising outcomes of elections. But if you dive into those, you will see something that is quite fundamental you will see more and more people who feel left behind by the system, by the elite, by the political elite or business elite, and that's eroding trust in society. And at the core, that's what sustainability is about. This is not just about greenhouse gas, gas emissions or climate change. This is about a fundamental reconstruct of societies. If you want to focus on climate, then the crisis is now pretty uh, serious. And again, the questions I got, all I saw while traveling the world over the last uh, few months, it was summer in the Northern Hemisphere, was images of Australian farmers walking on their land struck by droughts, having to kill their own animals because it wasn't humane to let them live any longer. How can you even talk about climate change if that's happening? How can you even say there is not a climate policy when today the Prime Minister announces a $5 billion drought resilient fund? That's pretty late climate policy, but it's climate policy for you. And what I said, trust in society is now so much eroded. Uh, the fake news has become a new word. Uh, but also in sports, I think you had some more incidents here yourself in business, in tech, in what is the future that we can offer people. And yet there is also hope from strange and unsuspected places. The SDGs have been agreed. The Sustainable Development Goals were agreed in 2015. 17 goals, 169 targets describing the future we want. This was, of course, done in the United Nations, and this is basically the answer to anyone who wants to know what is sustainability about. We had the Millennium Development Goals, who talked about eradicating poverty. The Sustainable Development Goals talk about a future, an integrated approach to a future, where both planet, people are all in a balanced manner. And then there is the Paris Agreement. I think last time I checked, Australia is still part of that. Even though I think you've politically said you won't have time this year to do much about it, and you might not even come to the COP. Well, I'll just give you a warning shot. That's going to kill the competitiveness of this country. Because the move to a low-carbon society is now inevitable. It cannot be stopped. It will not be stopped. The world will move there. And, you know, I said on television that we should be realistic. Business people are not dreamers. I'm not a hippie. This is a country that is, for its economy and for many of its businesses, dependent on coal. And decarbonization means we're going to have to move away from coal. But if your economy is dependent on that, that's a lot trickier than if you have no coal or just a little. 
So the transition pathways in Australia will look different than they might look in other countries. But transition you must. And so therefore business must take the lead in what is the end point on the horizon where we want to go. And then we can have debates, is can we do that in 10 years, in 5 years, in 20 years? And create pathways to get to that end goal. But do not stick your head in the sand. What I'm basically trying to tell you is that in the next 10, 15 years, the world will go through massive system transformations. And that's very uncomfortable news for those of you in business, because I've been in business, like I said, and in business we are great at managing incremental improvements. A little bit of productivity, a little bit of pricing power, a little bit of whatever, and the margins will go up, the value will go up, we get our bonus, we go home and we try it again. But this is system transformation, radical system transformation. And it's not going to be because I'm now in the sustainability space that I believe sustainability will be the only reason. The main driver for system transformation is going to be technology. If we're smart, and I'm talking globally humanity, sustainability will be the shaper of the transformation. It's no longer just about the environment. It has to be about people, society, social capital, as much as just the, the, the climate, the water, the whatever else we look at. It's tough, you know? There are now new concepts called science-based targets. And uh, if you look at TCFD, I know some of the companies in Australia have taken that really seriously. If you look at the science-based targets for climate change versus where you make your cash flow today, you will face dilemmas. There are companies making brilliant cash flow, which are totally opposed to science-based targets. What are you going to do? Again, same thing, find tradition pathways. And the biggest challenge probably for business is how do we deal with the tension between competition and collaboration? Because all of us, and Aussie entrepreneurs are amongst the toughest in the world, all of us are grown in models of we will outcompete competition. We're better, smarter, faster than anybody else. But none of the businesses I work with, and we work with some of the largest, are big enough, impactful enough to deal with these challenges alone. Only when we work together in platforms like yours will this work. So let me give a few quick examples of these radical system transformations. Let's start climate. That seems to be the hot topic in town. So the IPCC has published its report two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago. The IPCC one and a half degrees report. There's two messages screaming in your faces. One is one and a half degrees warming will be reached sooner than expected. It could be there at 2040. The second is, and that's a little more concerning, we thought we would have a safe operating space up until two degrees. That hope is taken away. You may not even want to talk about climate in the countries, particularly in your politics. The rest of the world is now shifting, saying, how can we stop at one and a half degrees warming? We in WBCSD over the last three, four days at 500 something business executives from around the world. I got to make a speech to them. I said one and a half degrees is now the top. That's where we're gonna go. Three years ago, people would have thrown things at me or asked me to be fired and taken home. Everybody accepted this is now the challenge we need to go to. Nobody agreed it would be easy, but we accept the challenge. Look at mobility. The way you move around towns like Sydney. Uh, electric vehicles are here, not in your town, by the looks on the streets, so much. In, in many of the other cities of the world, you will find lots of electric vehicles. Ten years from now, electric vehicles will be the norm. Norway has said no more combustion engines will be sold after 2025. The Dutch state, for instance, has been taken to court by an NGO. The duty of care of the state is to make sure that we stay below one and a half degree. They won the first case, state appealed, the, the appeal was overthrown. Dutch state is now held responsible, legally held responsible to deliver 
a strategy of decarbonization. Those are the things that will change. But cars will change much more. Autonomous vehicles, you may have heard of it, self-driving cars. And that combination, electric vehicles, self-driving cars, will lead to something new, which is mobility as a service. None of us, unless we're petrol hats, will continue to buy our own vehicles. If we need a vehicle, we'll Uber it, or whatever the service will be uh, in the future. That will mean a massive erosion of jobs. Like I said, I was in TNT. 50, 60,000 truck drivers around the world. Ten years from now, they will all be jobless. Skill set and age will not make it easy for them to find new jobs. Those job transition pathways need to be created now, unless we want more Brexits and other pleasant results. In January 16 next year, the science-based targets for the food system will be published. Because we, the people who want change, are getting a little smarter. We have analyzed why does climate action work? Maybe not here, but everywhere else. <laughs> what is it that we did well? And the answer is we made science indisputable. You can no longer argue with the IPCC. It is robust work. But if you look at the food system, which is as broken as any other system on the planet, what are we going to do to create science? Is sugar good? Is it bad? Is meat? Is whatever the conversations are. January 16, next year, the book will come out. It will radically change the conversation in the food system. Companies will be held accountable whether they deliver products that are in accord with the science. The biggest thing that will probably change in the, in the next few years is the definition of success in business. And there's many words you can use for it, you know. I think we make a mistake of talking about integrated reporting or ESG. Yeah, those are all instruments and tools that we need to think about. But at the core of it all will be the conversation about the cost of capital. So I, I said it before, I'm not a hippie. I wear the uniform. So I'm, I'm of course, concerned about polar bears or turtles in fishing nets. But it is going to only work if we change the definition on the cost of capital. And there's now plenty of examples. I mentioned TCFD. It's not so much the disclosure of emissions, it's the disclosure of processes that boards use to manage these risks and these emissions. It's the strategies that companies build to stay within a two degrees or one and a half degree world. That's where business decision making will change. There are now examples. Danone has a two billion dollar financing facility in a syndication with 12 banks and the interest rate in that two billion dollar loan will be determined by the fact whether the loan delivers against ESG targets three years out. If they meet ESG environmental and social targets three years out they will get a retrospective discount on interest. The cost of capital will be lower if they are more environmentally and socially performing. I was in India a few weeks ago, CEO of a coal-fired power company was complaining. The pension funds in California and Nordics have decided not to want to invest in that type of business anymore. And through syndication, they used to, in the past, be an important source of financing for these type of long-term assets. The cost of capital for loans of coal-fired power plants in India has now shot up to such a level that investing in that stuff makes no more sense. He is thinking about disinvesting the stuff he has and he has shifted to solar and wind for all the future. I don't know if India is a, a, a customer of yours in Australia, <laughs> but the financial market will stop the demand for you. So it's not just me shouting at you, please get serious and move out. It will be the financial market taking the assets down that will use the stuff that you were hoping to sell, making you completely uncompetitive as a country unless you get back on the forefoot. And you can. I know you can. 10, 15 years ago when I was involved in the acquisition of TNT, I met some of the boldest, brightest entrepreneurs in the world. In those days, the conversations that I had when I would meet other CEOs in this town would all be about, oh yeah, Australia is actually the center of Asia. We will dominate China and all that space. 
hasn't quite worked out, I guess, but <laughs> the confidence will soon come back. The business case, business case for sustainability is now so clear. No company here in the room can attract the talents it needs if it doesn't have a serious plan. Uh, one of the most famous oil and gas companies in the world, certainly one of the richest, Statoil in Norway, has changed its name to Equinor. Why? Because they can't get talents to work for a company that has the word oil in the name. It's the primary reason. Ask the CEO. The cost of inaction is shooting up everywhere. Unilever has more than $300 million of annual cost of disruptions in its supply chain as a result of changing weather patterns and intensity in droughts or floods. The cost is shooting up, the droughts here in your own country. The opportunities are everywhere. $12 trillion of economic opportunities by moving to the SDGs, according to the Better Business, Better World Report. And governance will catch up with you. Fiduciary duty of companies will change. So that brings me to the conclusion of this oration. And actually all I'm asking you to do is to show leadership. And the problem with asking an international speaker is that he or she, in, in this case he, completely damages your beautiful language because I'm not native. And I speak about lots of things in a language that I think sounds like English without not always knowing what the words mean. <laughs> so I talk about leadership all the time, you know, it sounds so good. Leadership, we need you. Um, but somebody said yesterday to me, there was a, a, a poster in the First World War with this finger. Your country needs you. Well, it's actually become your planet needs you. But leadership, if you go back to the origins of the word, to, to the basic origins of the English language, means path finder. And that's precisely what I want you to remember. Because I'm not here to tell you sustainability is a business case and this is where we're going to go. I don't quite know where we go. Roughly, we can give you the sketch. I certainly don't know how to get there, but you're going to have to find the path. And that's really what I ask of you. Be pathfinders. And it's fantastic to be here, to be the guest of SBA, as it once was called, but not anymore. Today, it becomes, ta-da, <laughs> the BCSD Australia. <laughs> Thank you. Please now welcome Dr. John Hewson to the stage for a conversation with Peter Backer. Dr. Hewson recently joined the board of the newly named BCSD Australia and is also the new chair-elect. Thank you very much and thank you very much for being here. I'm not sure that I should sit on the right side of Peter or the left side but uh, I don't think it probably matters too much. For the viewer, it's <laughs> different. A very clear message, Peter, in what uh, you've given to uh, the broader Australian community. It is a uh, collaborative responsibility, as you said, although I'm one of those people who gets quite frustrated by the fact that the business community in this country doesn't provide the leadership, the pathfinding role that we think they can. It's starting to come. Uh, our politicians are so far behind, hmm. I think, the sentiment of the electorate. And I'm not going to make a political comment, but I did enjoy the result in Wentworth. <laughs> <clears throat> because it was recognition of the significance of the issue of climate. And the, you know, the argument I put at the time is, I think a government for forfeits its right to govern if it doesn't have a genuine climate action plan. So we don't want to spend too much time talking to each other. We wanted to give you the opportunity to ask as many questions as you like. Uh, we've got the opportunity of having Peter here, and uh, Peter's very keen to sort of ext extend and expand on some of the things he's said. So uh, can we take some questions? Yes, we'll start here. Peter, I'll just have a question. Given the fact that the science is so clear, the clarion bell is ringing, 
What is it that business does not understand in Australia or government to that point to take action so that we're not left behind, so that they can innovate and start to you know, see the opportunity for what it is? Can you repeat the question? Yeah, sure. So um, given the clarity of science, the indisputability of it, what is it that is holding back business and or government here in Australia to act? Is that good? So, why well, I, I, it's impossible for me to comment on the um, Australian psyche, and nor should I comment on political developments in the country, because I just don't understand enough of it. But any time, no, that's, <laughs> I, I, I do begin to realize we're in the room of the converted, so we're all pretty much in <laughs> agreement. But any time, any country, Australia is no different, is busy with its own politics and changes prime minister five times in a couple of years, you're going to be inward looking. And when you're on an island on the other side of the planet, far, far away from many of the other economics, you are at risk of not seeing that your little boat is floating in a direction where nobody else is going. And that's not an analysis of the psyche or the reasons why you don't move. I actually, I saw some encouraging signs, climate. Uh, the, one of the associations of directors uh, mm. was last week, I believe, uh, came out with a survey saying the number one risk facing business is climate. Sure. Uh, one of the big mining companies coming out, we need a price on carbon. So there are some voices. What I, what I can only tell you is that the strange thing about Australia at the moment is, is business seems to be looking at politics and use it as an excuse not to move. And that's something that I see nowhere else anymore. I saw that five years ago everywhere, and then you had these debates, China wouldn't move until America, and America thought there was no point in moving because China, also that has all died away. And that's because it's, and it's not even the science that is so clear. It is clear, I mean, that's, but not too many people will read up on the science. It's just the weather is changing. Two storms in the US, $30 billion, 11 typhoons, Southeast Asia, $10 billion. Uh, 100 people dead in Portugal, I don't know how many. In Sweden, Sweden, I don't know if anyone ever been to the north of Sweden. It's mainly wet and gray. Um, there were so many forest fires in the north of Sweden that all the forest, f the firefighters in Sweden combined could only cover 25% of the surface mm -hmm. to deal with it. California, Australia and the droughts, floodings in India. The intensity is going up anywhere. I, I, I guess people look at the news here. How can droughts not be climate related to the extent and the consistency that they're building up here? So I don't think there is a reason not to act. I don't think there's a reason for the US to step out of the Paris Agreement other than fixed economic interests. Some people are better served staying in the model as is. And they will argue along an art for it. And that's probably their right because that's what incentivizes them. But I think, you know, that's where BCSD Australia steps in by promoting things like TCFD that will radically change the governance and the transparency. There's now yesterday or two days ago in, in Singapore, we helped COSO, which is the International Enterprise Risk Management, to for the first time ever, these, these are the as nerdy accountants as you can possibly ever find, <laughs> have issued the guidance to integrate ESG environment and social indicators into enterprise risk management systems. That will force every board to answer not just balance sheet ratio questions, but environmental and social questions. Some countries, China next year in nationwide, will step up the carbon price and we'll see whether that accelerates. I think, you know, leading companies must lead. And all of you must realize that if you do not lead and if politics in Aussie cannot be improved, the country will just go down and down in the rankings and lose competitive position. And you don't want that to happen because you're pride people, you're smart people. I mean, I used to run a company that was built by Sir Peter Ablis. 
he, he, he started, well, actually it was somebody else starting it, running toilets from one end, toilet pots from one end to the other end in Sydney. By the time we bought it, it, it had operations in 70 countries. It was a crazy economics, I have to add, flying aeroplanes around all of the world. It was Australian entrepreneurship that built it. Turn the focus on this agenda, you'll rule again. Keep turning it on the past, we'll just forget about the island. So, question just here in the middle. What are your Dutch mathematicians saying about rising sea levels these days? We think it is a problem in Australia nowadays. No, it's, it's a very interesting point and, and a crazy point in, uh, to illustrate. Uh, I don't know whether the mathematicians in the Netherlands have anything to say on it, but there's a more important commission on this topic, which is the Commission for Delta Works. So as you know, half the country of the Netherlands is between three and five meters below sea level. So if sea level were to rise, this country would half disappear and probably more. And uh, Amsterdam, Rotterdam, all these big towns are underwater and gone. So it's a, it's a major threat conceptually. Uh, two months ago, the Commission for Delta Works, which is there to protect the country against sea, came out with a report saying the sea level rise is accelerating and we must prepare the country for three meters of sea level rise by the end of the century. And three meters, that's a lot of water. Because it's not always stable, you know, occasionally you'll have a storm, it gets a bit higher, it gets rather... And so their recommendation was, if we want to protect the country and sustain life in the Netherlands, we better start investing now. And then the crazy thing happened. Well, I, was happen I happened to see that edition of the news. So this you know, very serious gentleman was making these statements. And then the NGO, uh, Environmental Protection NGO, was being interviewed. And I would have expected these people would have been furious at this report. And they said, wow, we're so glad that the Commission is now taking this serious. And we should really protect the country by the end of the century against this from happening. Since when is an NGO there to be in agreement with the government? <laughs> we should fight climate change now. And, and all of you, I mean, you're here because you get this, yeah? I don't think you come and listen to me to be convinced because I don't think I could convince you anyway. <laughs> You need to be convinced, okay. But all of you understand this stuff. But all of you, whenever you speak about sustainability, please do not speak anymore that you do this for your children or the children of your children. Because this shit will hit us in your lifetimes. It's happening on your watch. So please don't talk too much about what will happen at the end of the century. You must do things now. And it's not just climate, it's plastic in the oceans. It's jobs in the future. It's all these things. Okay, yes, on the right here. Oh, okay, fine, sorry. Thank you. Um, Peter, you talked um, about the shift from sustainability being just about the environment to broader social issues. I'd just be interested in hearing you talk more about that. Yeah, no, so um, President Trump, let me start there. It's always good to, <laughs> to get people's attention. A couple of months ago, went to Ohio, put on a hard hat, posted a few miners behind him for the photo, and said, I'm living up to my speeches in the, in the uh, whatever the campaign, and I'm going to bring mining jobs back to Ohio. And uh, he was uh, withdrawing all kind of coal fire power restriction policies that Obama po administration had put in. And so you look at that and you think, wow, what happened here, you know, coal mining, why would you want to go back to that? So we actually ran the numbers. So there are 80,000 miners in uh, the USA. And yes, these jobs are all at risk. And I'm sure here in Australia, that's given the, the big impact in your econ economy, it may even be many more jobs. But they're still all at risk over time. We need to find pathways for these people out of there. But the numbers in the USA is 80,000 miners, 2.3 million people employed in renewable energy. 
So the transition from a job point of view had no social impact whatsoever at macro level. But that's not the point. Because jobs don't move at macro level, they sit at kitchen tables being worried about their children going to university. And when you're jobless or threatening to lose your job, you're going to worry. And then somebody comes on the television and says he has an answer. And you don't care whether that's the right answer or the wrong answer. You think, well, that's better than the clown who is in the office now. And you vote. So 80,000 miners now look at other jobs. I, I said many times I used to be in the trucking business. There are four, no, 6.4 million truckers in North America and Europe today. The prediction is, and this is not me, this is the OECD, prediction is that 4.4 million of these mostly gentlemen will lose their jobs in 10 years from now. And why is that? Because of autonomous driving trucks. You can drive a truck from Portugal, Lisbon, to Warsaw, Poland, in 20 hours if you put no driver on it. You need three days if you have to comply with resting times and all that stuff. If you put trucks 30 centimeters apart, 10 after each other, you'll save 40% of diesel, 40% or more of greenhouse gas emissions. The amount of accidents will reduce by 80 or 90 percent. Why? Because these things will drive themselves and sensors are a little more consistent than people. So 4.4 million jobs will be gone. These are truck drivers. What are they going to do? We need lots of nurses because people are getting older and need more care. We need many more teachers. Well, the truck drivers I know don't quite qualify for either of those positions. <laughs> we need coders for whatever program and IT apps we need. That's going to be quite a tough transition as well. So net, net, macro, macro, there's now plenty of studies saying the digitization is going to be good because we're going to create jobs. But that's not the answer. The transition from jobs we lose and the types of jobs we create needs to be managed. And I don't want to belabor the point too long, but the traditional answer from business, I would argue even of the more forward-thinking business people in this room, is, yeah, but labor market, that's up to government. We business people, we employ, but we, we're here to make a bit of money. Yes, we'll take good care of our people, but we're not here to solve imbalances in labor markets. Well, you're wrong. The labor market is just like the atmosphere. So far in history, ups and downs, ebb and flow have always been balancing each other and you can leave it to the public good to manage the disband, the unbalances. In this massive transition driven by IT, which will go global overnight, you know, Uber and Airbnb, these companies were formed in less than five years. Airbnb is now the biggest hotel chain measured in number of rooms or nights booked didn't even exist 10 years ago. So these transitions will go so rapid that the disbalances and the transition stress will be so high that you cannot make it the public good anymore for the, the governments or the social security networks to fix it. Business will need to fix it. So concepts like lifelong learning will come back. Uh, very creative ideas like uh, I'm going to pay you a $100,000 salary. I'm going to pay you another $50,000 for your education. I'll put it in a saving account. You can use it when you think you need to re-educate yourself. You can also go on holiday for the money, if that's what you prefer to do. But then you first pay 80% tax. <laughs> Invest it in yourself, you pay no tax. That's things that business can do. So we need whole new thinking on the social paragraph. We need to wholly new think is a 40-hour work week, or whatever the max is in your country, is that still what we need? Or are we going to parcel it up in different ways? And I don't, know, I, I don't know about you guys, but I've been in business quite a while. I would never wait for the government to, to design that for me. I would sit down in a group like, like yours and say, what would be answers that we can collectively dream up? And then you're the, 
driver of the future, the pathfinder. Okay. Yes, please. Sorry, I just had a question. Maybe it's for both John and Peter. It goes back to that three meter sea level rise, but it also goes back um, to a report, and I'm sorry, I can't remember the report, but um, uh, you know, the, the basically on the sort of the melting of the glaciers, and the only way to basically adjust for that would be to somehow bund the whole of Antarctica, which would be an enormous expense. So, just have you ever done any calculations on the cost of, say, what it would cost? to stop, prevent a three metre sea level rise around the Netherlands. And I just don't know, the, the cost of trying to bund the Antarctic uh, continent would be, uh, it'd probably bankrupt the world, right? So there's this argument that says, economically, we are better off just going along and mitigating for the costs of climate change. Well, why don't we see why don't you publish reports and say, well, if we did that, the cost is going to be so much. It's not going to be trillions, it's going to be quintillions. Yeah, so the, um, at global level, and I think it has been separated into continents, not in individual countries as far as I know, but at globally there's a thing called the New Climate Economy Report. That's a very interesting resource to, to look into. Uh, came out about two years ago, has been updated uh, this sep last, well, whatever, where are we, this September. Um, and it basically says the world will invest $90 trillion in the next 15 years in infrastructure. It's a massive amount of cities and other infrastructures being built. If we decide now to invest all those dollars in infrastructure on green science-based targets, the maximum increase of cost would be 4%, which is just roundings. So we, we have an enormous opportunity in front of us by now making the right investment decisions. I have no idea what it would cost to do whatever you suggest we do to the Arctic. I couldn't even imagine the cost of it. I, I have no idea what it would even cost to build dikes and other solutions to keep three meters of water out of an insignificant country like the Netherlands. It will blow up the budget for many a decade, I'm sure. Um, I have no idea what the cost is for the droughts that are here now in Australia, to the farming community, to the, to the unpredictability of supply chains moving into the food system. There must be measurable cost today. But I think, you know, the problem with sustainability people, myself included, and this, this speech is always on the edge of going right and going wrong, is we can easily l lull ourselves into doom and gloom, you know, like, oh, well, it's too late now, isn't it? Um, that's not the right energy. The $90 trillion to be invested from tomorrow onwards, we can all make better choices. We can all build infrastructure. We're going to invest it anyway, because we're going to need the infrastructure. Let's make the right choices. And that's where business comes in. There's now plenty of companies in the world who, who are locked into RE100 or EV100 or all kind of science-based commitments. You know, if you, the next car you build or buy, and nobody here should con consider buying a diesel ever again. Nobody here should consider buying a combustion engine ever again. Electric vehicles are fine. And yeah, if you want to go long distance in Australia, rent a car the two times a year that you do it. Because you're all running around the block in Melbourne and Sydney for the majority of your kilometers. It's simple choices you make. Begin with one day without meat. Move it up to two. And soon you'll begin to enjoy it. Um, take a policy. Who of you have plastic bottles of water in your offices? Put a policy in place, no more plastic bottles. Give anybody for $10 a metal or a glass bottle, put your logo on it saying, I'm really proud that you work here. If you want to drink in this office, you use this. 
It's simple stuff we can all do. And then slowly, but certainly, the mind shift will change. And then we see the opportunities. And that's the lens you should be looking for. Yeah, I think, unfortunately, I've just got the sign that I've got to cut it off. Oh. I'll just make one comment, though. I, I think it emphasizes the need for a lot more strategic thinking in a country like Australia. I mean, mm. we, our political system is so short-term and focused, we live by hour by hour or day by day mm. at best. But the business community and some of the other levels of civil society can actually lead in terms of some of that strategic thinking and getting people to think about the day-to-day -day choices they make in the context of those longer-term uh, strategic plans. So I think it's a great opportunity for people to start to you know, see what they can do. That old Kennedy statement, don't ask what the country can do for you, but ask what you can yeah. do for the country. That sort of thinking is fundamentally important in this respect. Yeah. Now, I, I think we need to bring it to a close, unfortunately. And uh, you want us to go off, is that? Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thanks, Thank you. <laughs>